Well, good morning, Charleston Southern. It's great to see you this morning. I appreciate so much the opportunity to share with you. If you have a copy of God's Word or an app on your phone or a device you like to use, you can find the book of John from me. The book of John, the fourth book in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or fourth book in the New Testament, rather, John chapter 12. And as you find John chapter 12, as I was being introduced, I so appreciate your president and his heart. And thank you for applauding for my family. I have six children. It was so awesome to sleep by myself in the hotel last night. It was great. Nobody peed on me. Nobody got in bed with me by myself. My three-year-old Rhett, I think he's going to be our testimony. We have a feeling he's going to run a prison ministry from the inside one day. And Rhett... Rhett's got this thing now where he walks up to me, and he's a little bitty fella. My, my two oldest sons are, are a little bit larger, big boys. Uh, when they were babies, they were big babies. Now they're good-looking, athletic kids, you know. Uh, oh, my oldest son said, Dad, am I going to be tall? So you see me. I'm pretty short. My wife's short. I'm like, you better not be tall. But... Uh, so Rhett's real little. I don't know why our children got smaller. I told my wife, I'm like, I'm tapped out of DNA. I've given it all away. I don't know. But uh, the biology major may disagree with that. But so I, so Rhett walks up to me. He's like this big. And he'll walk up to me and he'll take his sleeves and he'll roll them up. He's really proud of his muscles like John Davis. He's really proud of them. So he rolls them up and he'll say, hey, dad, what you going to do? And like, I want to be sensitive and kind, but like, I'm going to beat your little... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it reminds me of that story. I, I remember being on the middle school football team in Montevallo, Alabama, where I was born and raised. It's in the center of the state. And we practiced a couple of blocks from the school. And one year we started football practice the same time the band members started band camp a few weeks before school started. It was super hot. And we were walking back from practice one day. And one of the guys on the team was named Willie Ledlow. And Willie was picking on a seventh grader. I was an eighth grader. And Willie was an eighth grader. And he's a pretty good ball player. And, and we were kind of leaders on the team. And this little seventh grader, Willie wasn't going to hurt him, but he was a mess. I'm like, leave him alone, Willie. We well, you know how this works with guys, right? There's this kind of like face off. Willie gets up in my face. What you going to do, man? What you going to do? You, you're going to tell me I can't mess with him? He's a seventh grader. I'm, I, I'm initiating him. This is orientation. I was like, Willie, don't pick on him, man. We're all tired. Let's go. And then he bows up. And you know that decision you make? You're like, is this going to turn into a fight? Because I can tell you there was a time in my life where I cared about masculinity and muscles. But at 42 years old, I'm fully domesticated now. I remember a couple of years ago, I bought my wife a van at seats 12 people it's like I'm married to the UPS driver and 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 uh and she's hot too but I'm married to the UPS driver and and, and uh, I'm a preacher not a priest and uh she she uh so she so she uh so so I'm at home bragging to my dad my brother I'm like dude this thing will seat 12 he's like bro it's over for you man you're bragging on a van I go you're right it is over for me but back when Willie Ledlow confronted me, I thought I had to be pretty macho, and he bows up. And then there's that moment where, is this going to turn into a fight? And Willie bows up, and I'm like, Willie, I'm not backing down, man. Just chill out. And right then and there, he did something I'll never forget. Willie Ledlow kissed me right on the lips. <laughs> and he took off running. I couldn't catch him. I didn't know what to do. He was just messing with me. I didn't know how to respond, had all kind of questions, did some therapy. No, I'm just kidding, but... Most of what life is, is how you respond. And, and, and the reality is when you begin a new semester, and I know you're in syllabus shot right now, I, I get that. I, I was not what I would determine to be college ready. I remember my first year of college. I went on my first day of class, and I had no idea what was going on. In fact, a, a, a girl that I had met said, I've got a missed class. Can you tell me, did the professor have the syllabus? I said, I don't know. He looked pretty healthy to me. I, you know, the... The, I, I just wasn't ready. I didn't know. I didn't know how to respond. And you know what I've learned as a pastor now? As a pastor, one of the things that always amazes me is the different ways people respond to the gospel. Because there's a lot of false gospels out there. There are a lot of twisted gospels. And I get it. I recognize that even in a service of this nature, this is not a Sunday morning. Even in a service of this nature, there are those of you in here who the Lord is working in your life in a mighty way. In fact, it may very well be your own walk with the Lord that brought you to Charleston Southern. You may be studying for ministry. You may be studying to go out and serve. 
And then there are others of you that you came to Charleston Southern for virtually no spiritual reasons. And yet because of the Christian foundation of this university, there is a sense of obligation and requirement to make a certain number of chapels. And so you're here and you're here to go to the motions and you're already thinking, man, this guy hadn't even gotten to the text yet. Are we going to be late? You will not be late for lunch. And let me tell you why. I struggle sometimes because preachers get fat. They do. Love being a preacher. Not a condescending, judgmental, legalistic guy. I just love telling people God's word. I don't want to look like a preacher. They're not doing good. You know, they're always walking up to you and their tie stops about right here. Hello, brother. Good to see you. Right? I don't want to be that guy. So I've been working on losing some weight doing intermittent fasting. I'm going to tell you what intermittent fasting is. It's a Greek word for being in a bad mood. I'm just hangry, man. I mean, not angry, hangry. So, so, so I promise you, you won't be late for lunch. But if you'll lock in with me for just a few moments, I want to talk about responding. More specifically, how do you respond to the gospel? And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, okay, this is the pastor they bring in for the first chapel of the year, and he's going to give an invitation. He's going to ask people to receive Christ. Absolutely. If you are at a place in your life where you believe with all your heart that you are ready to trust Christ and follow him and submit to his lordship, I know for a fact there are people here who would love to pray with you and who would love to talk with you. But I will not manipulate the gospel. The gospel is so much more than you relieving the tension of the moment by praying the prayer that the guy on the stage wants you to pray. I'm not in any way against people praying and asking Christ to come into their life. And I certainly, as long as I have the privilege of communicating God's word, will always call people to a decision. But we are not in the international mission field. We are right here in North Charleston, South Carolina. And many of you have heard the story of Jesus over and over and over again. Yet, even in exposure to the gospel, people respond differently. I've been walking my church through the book of John for a couple of years. That's all we do. We take a Bible book and we walk through it verse by verse. And one of the fascinating journeys in John is this idea of believing what you have not seen, of believing becoming seen. We always say seeing is believing. Jesus would say, upon your belief, you will begin to see with your spiritual eyes. And around the end of chapter 12, the public ministry of Jesus is ending and his private ministry with the disciples will begin. In fact, the last half of the book of John really records just a few days and it's primarily Jesus talking to or praying over his disciples. It's called the farewell discourse. It's why if you have a red letter version of the Bible, most of the end of the book of John up until the resurrection is in red ink because it's Jesus talking to his inner circle. But just before that, his public ministry ends and people have heard the gospel. Everybody that's come in contact with him has heard him clearly say that he is the savior of the world sent to die for the sins of men and women. And yet, even in the face of seeing that, of observing the works, People still had three responses. Let me show you what I mean. John chapter 12, beginning in verse, around verse 36, the second half is where it breaks. When Jesus had said these things, and these things really capture everything that he's been teaching, but more specifically about his own death, the Son of Man being lifted up. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself. Though he had done so many signs before them, They still did not believe in him. So this is not an unreached people group. This is not a people distant from anybody that can communicate the gospel. These are people who have seen with their own eyes what Christ has done and what he has said. And by the way, that's why he did miracles. His miracle working was never to promote some power you or I could have. It was to show his deity how he was fully man and fully God. This is why modern day people who peddle supernatural acts to try to draw you into being manipulated emotionally are not preaching the gospel. Miracles always touch the person that they touched, but they primarily gave testimony to the fact that this was 
God in the flesh. And they still did not believe. The scripture says, beginning in verse 38 of John chapter 12, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He's quoting Isaiah 53. Then he quotes Isaiah 6, verse 39. Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. So the whole purpose of the book of John is given at the end of the book of John. It's in John chapter 20, where John says, I have written these things so that you may believe, and by believing you may have life. Yet the first response to the gospel John comments on here is the hardened. People who are hard, who just say, I've seen it, I've heard it, I don't believe it. There are some of you who may fall into that category. You may be sitting here today saying, hey, listen, if it works for you, great. But you have not been treated the way I've been treated by quote-unquote Christians. You do not know the struggle that I'm in. You've not been exposed to what I've been exposed to. You're not reading the same library I'm reading from. I have heard it, but I do not believe it. What would this passage speak to that? According to the scripture... God is not surprised nor caught off guard by your unbelief. You see this passage that John quoted out of Isaiah in verse 40? Matthew quotes it. Mark quotes it. Luke quotes it. John quotes it. And here's the reason why. This is not preached very much now, but it's so true. God is never taken aback when people reject him. It does not diminish his power or his control. And it reiterates that even the wonderful experience of believing in Christ is in and of itself a gift from God. This is why the Bible says in verse 40, according to what Isaiah, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Many scholars believe that what the New Testament writers saw was Israel time and time again being given multiple opportunities to believe and trust God and time and time again through the hardness of their heart rejecting him so much so that the window of opportunity has closed. Now listen, what do we do with that? Because I've got a Bible In fact, I've got a book of John which says, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him. I've got a Bible that says to any person, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've struggled with, no matter what you've done, you can turn in repentance and faith and the scripture promises. It doesn't just hope, it promises that you'll be saved. So how do we balance the tension between a scripture that says, turn this day and experience the day of salvation And a scripture that also says there are times and places where people are so hardened, their window of opportunity is closed. I don't have a verse to relieve the tension. In fact, I wouldn't be being faithful to the word if I told you there was a verse that relieved the tension. When God is sovereign, it means he's sovereign over salvation, which gives me encouragement to believe, to believe that today is a day that someone can be saved. But there's no promise for tomorrow. See, one of the struggles when you're young is that when you begin to think about your life according to God's will, you're faced with the choice of that over the pleasures of the world. And I've had many conversations with students in our church that say, hey, you know what? I see myself getting back to where I need to be. But right now, right now, I'm really enjoying doing my thing. The problem is I have no biblical precedence to promise you tomorrow. I have no promise in Scripture that says you will have the opportunity to repent of your sin and believe tomorrow. So what do we do with this? How do you help someone who's hardened? Well, you pray. You pray for their heart. Not not only do you pray, you make sure that you live out your walk in front of them 
And, and you experience the joy of the Lord, which says that our pleasures are better when we pleasure in the Lord. You see, everything that we tend to chase after, whatever it is, if it's an academic accomplishment, an athletic accomplishment, if it's a sexual relationship with someone, if it's a temporary uh, pleasure through some sort of substance, whatever it is that people are chasing, what they're ultimately chasing is pleasure. The interesting thing about pleasure is that God is the designer of pleasure, so the most pleasure from everything in the world comes when it is done in God's order and in God's way. And the problem with pleasure and the pursuit of pleasure is that it has a law of diminishing returns. The the only thing that pleasure leaves you wanting more of if pleasure becomes the object of your existence is more pleasure. If you are driven by a GPA, there'll never be a point where you reach a highest one. If you are driven by accomplishing something athletically, there'll never be a point where you can honestly say there's not room to grow. If you are driven by some sort of relationship that you long to have with someone else, then there'll never be a point where they fully fulfill that need. But once you recognize that, and you see that when you as the created fulfill the purpose of the creator, then the pleasures that God has given us become even more enjoyable. When we think about that, we think about the hardness of heart, I think there's a lot of people that don't fall into that category. There's a second category. Not the hardened, but the hesitant. Look how the passage unfolds. Look in verse 41, if you're looking on your phone. Isaiah said these things because he saw the glory and spoke of him. Isaiah prophesied that a Messiah was coming, and he saw his glory, and he knew people would reject him. And I would just say a word to those of you who are training for ministry. Listen to me. Never judge the authenticity or the validity of your ministry by whether or not people respond to the gospel. Keep preaching the gospel and trust the sovereignty of God with the results. But then we get to verse 42 and listen to what he says. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities, so these are people in spiritual and legal authority in the Pharisees, many even of the authorities believed in him. Man, that's cool. When I read that, I'm excited. But then watch the next phrase. Believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. What's their motive? Why were they closets? Christians. Look what it says. So that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Think about that for just a moment. These people weren't hardened. They saw Christ, heard his message, and believed he was the Son of God. But they chose not to live out their faith Because even though they believed, they loved and placed more value in the glory of man than the glory of God. Now, let's just drop that into our context. What does that look like? If grades are your thing, when you love the glory of man more than the glory of God, you will spend more time studying and less time being consistent in your quiet times. If relationship is your thing... You'll show up at church, you'll enjoy songs, you'll listen to the pastor, but you'll still pursue a sexual relationship with your girlfriend. If accomplishments are your thing, you begin to define yourself by whether or not you are recognized as top in your class. If peacemaking is your thing, or friends are your things, you begin to judge your identity by how many likes your Insta post has, and not whether or not the God of glory is pleased with the way you're living your life. This hesitation is seen throughout Scripture. And you know what Jesus says about it? Jesus says, listen, if you deny me before men, then when it comes time for me to acknowledge you, I will not. That's what the Bible says in the book of Matthew. I'll put it on the screen for you. The Scripture tells us, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. What do you do if you're in the hesitant crowd? You know the first thing you do? You remember to love one another. Because I can tell you that every Christian in this room, at some point in your life, will find yourself in that hesitant crowd. But you challenge one another. Can I just assure you that one of the most miserable places to be in all the world is to be someone who truly believes in Christ yet chooses not to live for him because you're afraid of the pressures of the world. And the good news is 
God is gracious and he is kind. And you may say, well, how do I know? Is there room for me to turn things around? Could this be the semester that I begin to change spiritually? How can you, a stranger who doesn't even know me this afternoon, after I enjoy time with your leaders, I will go back to my home. You will go about your life. I don't know you. You don't know me. And I would never stand up here on this stage and pretend to diagnose everything you're dealing with. So who are you, pastor, to stand there and tell me there is hope for me to move from being hesitant in my faith and compromising in my personal walk to being a woman of God who is filled with the Spirit and honors the Lord in in the obedience of my life and to be a man of God who decides that I'm going to step up, sign up and show up and live out my faith. How can you with confidence tell me there is hope? I'll tell you how I know. You woke up this morning, didn't you? Scripture is very clear that God at any point in his life can choose to discipline us even unto death if he chooses to. But the Bible celebrates the reality that there are new mercies awaiting every morning. I care not where you've been or what you've done today. If you're hesitant, if you're holding your faith close, if there are areas of unrepentance today, you can say, you know what? I'm going to turn and make Christ my first love. And I'm going to walk in the newness of life that he promised when he gave his life to me. And you may say, well, you don't know how complicated that's been going to be. You don't know the ramifications of that decision. I do not. But I have an empty grave that tells me there is nothing in your life more powerful than the redemptive power of the blood of Christ. And you can move from being hesitant. There's one more group. They're the hardened, they're the hesitant, then there's the group I want to be in, the whoevers. Look what the Bible says in this passage, if you're following along with me. Verse 44, last thing Jesus says publicly in the book of John, last thing before his arrest, his crucifixion. And Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light so that whoever, doesn't matter your background, whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge. Now, when he comes back, he'll come to judge. But the first time he came, he did not come to judge. He tells us why. I did not come to judge, second part of verse 47, to the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me does not receive my words as a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I, Jesus is very clear about this. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that this commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. I covered the hardened. I covered the hesitant. What does a whoever woman look like? What does a whoever man look like? What did they believe? You are at a place of academic excellence. You came here because our society says if you acquire the knowledge of an undergraduate degree, a graduate degree, it will help you have a more marketable career that you can then provide for your family. All of you have different motivations and different interests, but you're here today to study. So don't shut that off when you open God's word. Go with me. Let's not water it down. Let's bowl each other up. What does it mean to truly be the whoever? First, you have to believe that God sent Jesus. You have to believe that God sent Jesus. The scripture bears this out over and over again. One reference that I give you is in John chapter 3 verse 17 where the scripture talks about God sending Jesus. If you can put it up there, he speaks about how we understand that Jesus was sent by God. Secondly, you have to believe that Jesus is God. That Jesus is the Son of God. I don't know why we're not saying that anymore. I'm not asking you to receive a motivational speaker into your life who wants to line up all your goals and dreams and help you accomplish happiness. Listen to me. God cares so much for you that he wants the greatest amount of happiness for you. But the greatest amount of happiness for you is not for you and I to treat Jesus as a motivational speaker that we plug into our life for our current battle. 
The greatest joy is recognizing he's a victorious warrior king who came to redeem the world. It's done and finished, and the finished work of Christ on the cross, capped off by a grave that was vacated because death could not hold him, means he's coming back. And in eternity, we are but a grain of sand in time. Yet we have the opportunity to seal our fate in glory if we believe upon him and write a blank check with our life. To say, Lord, my joy and my glory is found in you because you are the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the sinless Alpha and Omega, and the sufficiency of who you are is enough. If you do nothing else for me because you came, I will trust in you. And when we begin to flesh that out, that God sent Jesus and that Jesus is God, according to this passage, we also see our spiritual eyes open. Somebody's sitting here this morning saying, dude, I just don't get it, man. I just don't get it. I'm around people who get it. There are parts of me that want it, but I don't get it. Friend, I want you to know, if you think that you can get it on your own, then I've woefully come up short. You have to pray for God to open your spiritual eyes to see him for all of his glory. And then we obey. We obey. I love the grace of Jesus that we will never earn. But the validity of our faith is not seen in the profession of our lips. It's seen in the behavior of our life. I'm so thankful Christ didn't ask me for perfection because I fail him often. But the testimony of the validity of my salvation is not seen in whether or not I'm perfect. It's seen in the remorse I feel when I do sin, not because I'm better than you or you're better than you or you're nicer than him or you're holier than her, but because upon salvation, the Bible says, the scripture teaches us, the spirit of God comes to live in us And he begins to transform us now into what he's already declared us to be. And when the Spirit of God lives in you, then when you do sin, you mourn over it. You don't enjoy it. It's pleasurable for a moment, but there is regret the next day. And that is a testimony to God saying, I have something better for you. And it doesn't drive you to a legalistic walk where you measure your righteousness by whether or not you want up your roommate. It drives you to a humble experience where you say, Lord, I am but a broken woman or a broken man, but would you give me the strength to clean my language up, to monitor what I'm looking at with my eyes, to cut porn out of my life, to redefine my relationship with my boyfriend, to speak honestly and openly to people, but cut out criticism and anger, to be a blessing to my professors and anyone I submit to, and to love the people around me. God, would you manifest your spirit in me in such a way that while the The world may say I'm a 19-year-old kid studying. The people I come in contact with will sense the presence of the living God in my life. Would that God give a woman in this room that kind of call and a man in this room that kind of call. And when we begin to see that obedience, what does this passage teach us? It teaches us that we can enjoy salvation from eternal judgment and eternal life. And that's how you respond to Jesus. So which are you? Are you hardened? If you are, I can't promise you tomorrow, but I can tell you if he woke you up today, today can be the day you ask him to begin to change your heart. Are you hesitant? You know the truth, but your life publicly doesn't match the private convictions you hold. Friend, line that up. And are you the whoever? Then keep chasing and keep growing, doing the things that God wants you to do. Thank you for the honor of preaching his word to you. Let me pray over you. Father, as we go about our day, I pray for the hardened to be softened, for the hesitant to be given courage, and for the whoever to be given the perseverance to continue to be the man and woman you've called them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.